when the, when the gentleman doing announcements makes you cry, you know, it could be an interesting uh, morning. So <laughs> I'm glad you're here. My name is Kevin Clark. I'm the senior pastor here at Encompass Church. And this morning, I want to share with you in the course of teaching out of scripture, the story of a woman named Mariama. Mariama was born into a prominent Muslim family in West Africa. And her father was a well-known, respected member of her community. And so she was raised in a home that was considered privileged. She didn't have to learn how to clean or how to cook or how to run a household like all of her uh, girlfriends in school had to learn. She had hired help to do all that. And uh, she was privileged to receive a first-class level formal education, which began with some extensive study of the Quran. And when she reached adulthood, her father arranged a marriage with a respected, wealthy uh, young man who was a part of the community and everyone was excited for their new family. When she became pregnant with her first child, several childhood friends of hers invited her to a video showing uh, done by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. There was a woman missionary who was there to host the showing. And during the video, Billy Graham read Acts 4.12, which says, And there is salvation in no one else, meaning Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Mariama was furious about this claim. She sat in her seat enraged and vowed not to come back. And several days later, the same friends came to her and said, we need you to come back because we've been going to listen to the missionary woman and she's teaching us things that we're not sure are true. You know the Quran better than anyone we know. Will you come and help us discern what is right and wrong? That night before she went back to see the missionary, the night before, Mariama had a dream. And in her dream, Jesus appeared to her and said, don't be afraid, come to me. When she woke up, she wrote it off as just a very vivid dream. But the next night, she had the same dream. And the next night. And the next night. And so one night, while she attended the talk with the missionary named Rachel, she waited afterward and asked Rachel if Rachel could explain why she might be having the dream. Rachel explained how Jesus calls us to himself, makes us aware of the sin that is in our lives, and offers what he has done on the cross as payment for our sin. That night, something clicked for Mariama, and she prayed and received Christ. And she says, it was like the Holy Spirit physically lifted a huge weight off of me. She went home and told her mother and her husband, and they both told her never to speak of it again. But she couldn't stop talking about Jesus and she couldn't stop reading the Bible that the missionary had given her. So after a time, with her persistence, her husband became very angry and he began to beat her every time she talked about Jesus. Eventually, a second baby was born that did not dissuade her and so he filed for divorce. After she was sent out of their family home with the two kids, she went home to her parents. And a few days later, as she was running errands, her husband came to the house and took the kids away by force. When she got back and realized what had happened, she went to court, but the courts sided with her husband because her conversion to Christianity made her unfit. Today is week eight in a teaching series that we have been calling immediately. And we are unpacking the first eight chapters of the gospel or book of Mark. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app and you'd like to follow along, today we'll start in Mark chapter four, verse one. Each week I've told you we call this series immediately because Mark uses a Greek word pronounced euthaos, 
40 times in his gospel. And the best translation of that word in most of those contexts is immediately. Mark uses that word to show us the urgency with which Jesus pursued the call that God the Father had placed on him and the urgency with which he calls us to respond to him. Now, I've told you each week that Mark was most likely, the book of Mark was most likely written in or around Rome in the mid-60s AD, which was the time period in which persecution of Christians became a state-sanctioned activity and ramped up drastically. So as we read Mark, we always have to remember in the back of our minds that it was first and foremost written to a group of ordinary people like us who were followers of Jesus, but were living in a time of great fear. They were asking themselves, is Jesus really the one I was told he is? Is he worth my life? Now, last week in chapter three, we saw four different groups of people come to Jesus and respond to him in different ways. And those same four types of responses are present in our society today. Some come to Christ only to extract a benefit, to get healed, to get him to fix a problem. Some come to Jesus to deny his authority. I'll acknowledge you were a historical figure, Jesus, but I am not going to respond to you as if you should have any power over my life. Some come to Jesus to demand his allegiance. I will follow you, Jesus, as long as you do what is on my agenda for my life. And a few come to Jesus to follow God's will. I asked the question last week, how have you come to Jesus. Now, Mark wanted his very first readers, these Christians facing persecution, to consider whether they had come to Jesus to pursue their own agenda or to follow his. He also wanted readers, if they had actually come to Jesus with the intention of following what he wanted them to do, to consider how committed they were ready to be. Were they ready to produce fruit for the cause of Christ. So in order to impose that question or present that question to his readers, Mark chose to share with them a parable that Jesus probably taught more than once. Look at Mark chapter 4. I'm actually going to read verses 1 through 20, and it's a long passage, but it's important to read it all so that we can pick it apart and fully grasp its meaning. Mark says this, Again, Jesus began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on the rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. 
Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. So in previous weeks, we've learned that Jesus in the beginning of his ministry went out and essentially provoked the Pharisees and the scribes. He taught things that did not agree with their perspective on how scripture should be taught. He healed people on the Sabbath day and in ways that they did not approve of. He cast out demons And he challenged them on many occasions to recognize that they themselves were not following God's word. So this made them angry and they went out and plotted against him. So Jesus left the city of Capernaum where he was centered at the time and began to move along the shore of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. And he began to teach and heal along that shore. That's where he was on this particular day. And once again, as we've seen in in previous uh, encounters with Jesus, there was a very large crowd that was following him. And so in order to teach them effectively, this time he climbed into a boat, pushed off from the shore, and either stood or sat in the boat and taught from there. Now notice that verse 2 says, and he was teaching them many things in parables. So this parable wasn't the only one that Jesus taught on that day. And in fact, chapter 4 gives us three more much shorter parables that we'll tackle in the next session that we have together. But Mark chose those four out of probably a much larger number to share with his specific audience, his persecuted first readers, because those four were especially pertinent to them. What Jesus taught on that day required more than a superficial understanding of God's intentions and methods. But a superficial understanding was all that most people in his audience had. And just like the people in the first century, sometimes we are guilty of having a superficial understanding of God's intentions and methods. And so we say shallow or uninformed or even sometimes unbiblical things about God himself. We might say things like, God would never give you anything that you can't handle. We might say that God ultimately wants you to be happy. And while those are nice things to say, they are unbiblical. They are not true. In his teaching, Jesus wanted to correct the faulty beliefs of the crowd that was following him. He wanted his followers, those truly committed to following God's will, to recognize how God works and what he typically does to bring us to him. And he wanted them also to know that there was a significant cost to following him. A true follower of Jesus always produces fruit. Some will produce more fruit than others. But there are no authentic followers of Jesus Christ who are fruitless. So to underscore the critical importance of that idea, Jesus twice in the context of this parable says to the crowd, pay very close attention to what I'm about to say. In verse 3, before he begins the parable, he says, listen. And then immediately upon finishing the parable with the crowd, in verse 9, he says, and he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, the Greek word that we translate listen and hear in those two verses is the same root Greek word. It's pronounced akuo. Akuo. 
And it means not just to listen or hear in the sense that the sound of the words arrives in your ear. It means to deeply comprehend and apply what you heard. Jesus later uses this same word when he's asked in chapter 12, what is the most important commandment of all? Chapter 12 tells us Jesus answered, the most important is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Now, Jesus was quoting Moses. He was quoting a passage that's found in the book of Deuteronomy, and he uses the word that when translated to Greek becomes the word akuo to say, don't let what I'm about to tell you go in one ear and come out the other. Listen to comprehend and apply what I am about to say. The most important command to keep in this life is to love God with every part of who you are. Hear this in a way that sinks into your soul and changes your life. And Jesus uses that same word to frame or bracket the parable we're looking at today, to stress its high importance. He says, listen, this story will teach you more about God and you than you can imagine. He says, hear if you have ears to hear. Three times bracketed around this parable, he says, akuo, akuo, akuo. Pay close attention to what you hear me say. Now, his parable begins with a sower. We would say a farmer. He says, behold, a sower went out to sow. So the farmer was in his field. He was spreading seeds. This was something they did by hand. It was a task that everybody in his audience would be probably either intimately familiar with because they'd done it themselves, or they would have seen it done as they passed by on a road, or perhaps they watched family members doing, it, doing that. Uh, but as they listened, they might have thought, the farmer in this story doesn't seem very good at his job. In verse number four, it says, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, the hardened area where people walked. Now, early the, earlier this summer, I had to reseed some bare patches in my lawn. And uh, so those patches, um, they're still a little bare. I didn't do it all that well, to be frank with you. Um, but I used a device like what's on the picture there. I used a device, the little two-wheeled thing where you put the seed in and I spread the seed with that. It has these little guardrail things on it. So when you get close to the sidewalk, the guardrails are supposed to keep the seed from landing on the sidewalk and it getting wasted. But it didn't work very well. And so when I got to the edges, I seeded by hand. So as you can probably tell, I'm not really a professional landscaper. Um, I was working in a much smaller area of the field. But as we read this, we see the sower spreads seed in places where it is not likely to grow. In addition to the path in verse 4, verse 5 to 8 tells us this. Other seed fell on rocky ground. Other seed fell among thorns. Other seeds fell into good soil. So was this a good farmer or a bad farmer? Later when Jesus' disciples asked him to explain the parable, in verse 14, Jesus said this, and my slides are slightly out of order there, the sower sows the word. What word is Jesus talking about? He's talking about God's word. The good news of the gospel, that a Messiah is coming who will save his people from their sin. He will live a perfect life. He will be fully obedient to God the Father, and he will exchange that perfect life on a cross so that those who do not have a perfect life can enter into a relationship with God. God sent Jesus first as the original sower, and then Jesus' followers who learned from Jesus to sow the word, to tell others about salvation through faith in Jesus. 
But ultimately, the sower, the top-level sower, is God himself. Yet some of God's seeds in this parable land in places which do not produce fruit. Now, rarely when we look at this parable do we ask the question, why would God spread his word where it might not produce much fruit? And the simple answer that's usually given is, well, this is actually a parable. It's designed to teach one lesson, not to answer every question about farmers and how they sow their seed. And so that's really not the point. But some of Jesus' more elaborate parables had more than one lesson embedded in them. And this is one of them. If God is the sower and he's willing to spread the seed even in places where very little fruit may result, what should that tell us about him? It should tell us that God pulls out all the stops, that no seed is wasted, that he wants to reach everyone, and that if even one person responds in a difficult arena, that sowing the seed was worth it. Any of Mark's first readers who happened to be Jewish, and some, but probably not the majority were, would be reminded of Isaiah 55, 11, in which God says, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So early readers of Mark's gospel who were facing serious persecution could know for certain that God will do whatever it takes to reach all who will follow Jesus. <coughs> Pardon me. In the heat of persecution, it would be incredibly easy for the people who are reading Mark's gospel for the very first time to say, because of what I'm experiencing, God must have forgotten me. I must not be important enough to him. But in the beginning of this parable, they would see a sower who will cast his seed anywhere there is a chance that something positive might come. That means each person, no matter how remote or unimportant or isolated or lonely or insignificant they feel, in God's eyes, is worthy of his word. Nevertheless, the main point of the parable is that many people will encounter God's word, but few will respond with a faith that ultimately produces fruit. Why not? Because these people are lumped into four different types of groups. So let's tear them apart in the time that we have remaining. Verse 15 describes the first group. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. Now, last week in chapter 3, we talked about scribes who, even though they studied God's word and they knew it intimately and they understood what they should be looking for in a coming Messiah, refused to recognize and acknowledge that Jesus could be the one. They actually attributed what Jesus was doing by the Holy Spirit's power to Satan himself. They had been blinded by Satan just like Jesus says in verse 15, Satan immediately comes and takes away what is sown in them. Despite the evidence, they steadfastly chose to reject the word of God. Some will hear, but fail to listen to the truth of Jesus. And many of us today have the same response to him. Us, by us, I mean people living in our culture today. Why do they have that response? Perhaps it's because they've been taught a worldview that denies the possibility of anything supernatural or that God exists. Or maybe their denial comes from a belief that if God did exist, he would never 
demand any kind of justice for our wrongdoing or our sin. Perhaps it comes from a conviction that human beings are ultimately good and that our good works should outweigh our bad ones. But ultimately it comes down to a supreme confidence that God in whatever form we might imagine him to take thinks like we think and accepts us as we are without any need for change. We are good enough. That's what Satan tells us. But Jesus came to tell us that's not true. In fact, God's standard is not good enough. God's standard is perfection and I will provide that perfection for you. Verse 16 and 17 describes the second group. It says, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. So for this group, God's word, the truth about our sin, the truth about salvation through Jesus, is at first received with great joy. But once that initial period of celebration and gratitude passes and following Jesus becomes more and more difficult, this group walks away. They seek the safety from trouble that they had before they encountered his word. They have no root, meaning no depth of understanding about Jesus or his call to us. And they can't imagine a God who loves them, who would allow them to suffer. Some will hear, but walk away if trials are not removed. And today, many people have that same response. Why? Well, most likely it's due to shallow or unbiblical teaching about him. Today, we actually have entire networks devoted to shallow, unbiblical teaching about God. Last night, for research purposes, I turned one on, and I watched for about six minutes, and that was about all I could take. They were teaching a prosperity gospel, which in effect says, and this gentleman I was watching, who I shall not name, said, God promises if you have enough faith, you will never again experience pain, powerlessness, or poverty, and that is my friends, is a lie. If you have a favorite TV preacher who says that, burn your TV. (laughs) I heard at least a dozen misleading or outright false statements made about God, and yet the audience sat there with Bibles open in their laps and said amen repeatedly to the false statements this teacher made about God. And the truth is when God allows them or initiatively puts them into a season of suffering to get their attention or to impact other people around them, most of those folks are gonna walk away because what that teacher promised them does not come to pass. Chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews is often called the Hall of Faith because it cites example after example of people in Scripture that had extraordinary faith and yet did not receive in their lifetimes what they hoped to see or receive. Verses 36 to 38 says, others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Jesus himself said to his disciples on the night before his crucifixion, in this world, you will have 
tribulation. And Christians like the apostles we call Peter and Paul, people of great faith who wrote part of scripture, experienced pain and powerlessness and poverty. And those two men were executed for their faith in Jesus. If they had believed that a loving God would never allow them to suffer, they would have walked away long before the end. But the root of their faith was far deeper. It wasn't rocky soil faith. It was deep faith. They knew God's plan for their salvation and the salvation of others superseded their desire for trial-free living. Verses 18 and 19 describe the third group. It says, and others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Jesus said, some will hear God's word, some will hear the truth about me, about their sin, about why I've come. But other things will choke out any real commitment. Millions of people walking the planet today have heard the gospel, have been struck by the power of what they have heard and the truth of how it applies to their own situation. And they have come close to committing to faith in Jesus, but they cannot bring themselves to say yes because saying yes to Jesus would mean saying no to something else they value more. When Paul was being held in prison by Roman authorities in the city of Caesarea, Caesarea, A Roman governor named Felix called him to explain the charges against himself and describe why he was being held. And so Paul did that in Acts chapter 24 verses, or rather Acts 4 verses 24 and 25. It says, after some days, Felix, the governor, came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned, as Paul reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, meaning judgment for sin, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. Felix heard about sin. He heard about righteousness. He heard about judgment. And he understood. He knew it applied to him. And he was alarmed. But he could not bring himself to respond in faith. Because to respond for him probably meant the loss of his position his reputation, and perhaps even his marriage and family. And like Felix, we worry about what we may have to give up if we follow Jesus. If I do the Jesus thing, I might not be able to pursue the career I want to pursue because that career is all about calling attention to me. Or that career is about using people in ways that allow me to acquire a benefit from them. If I follow Jesus, then I can't sleep with anyone I desire. And I still want that. If I take Jesus seriously, my friends will probably cut me out. And they won't want me to hang around with them anymore. And I still want that. Sometimes we put Jesus off. We think if I choose to follow him another day, that will be good enough. But both the Bible and psychology agree on this particular reality. Each time you refuse to make a decision that would cause a significant life change you are slightly less likely to make that decision the next time around. And sooner or later, we drop below the threshold at which a decision is even possible. 
Some will hear, but give other pursuits their top priority. We think, I can dabble in the Christian thing on Sundays and live the way I want the rest of the week, and that way I get the best of both worlds. Of course, Jesus says troubling things like this. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, God, takes away. In his parable of the sower, Jesus describes three kinds of soil that don't bear any fruit, that show no evidence at all that the person whom they describe has, done, has had any saving faith in Jesus. But verse 20 describes a fourth group. Jesus said, but those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Some will hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. Some bear more fruit than others, but none will be fruitless. Jesus says, if you really know me, you will bear fruit. Now, if, as verse 2 told us, Jesus taught many parables that day, why did Mark choose this one as one of the ones he recorded and shared with his first readers? He knew that his first readers were facing persecution, and they had a decision to make. That decision was, will I follow Jesus and bear fruit? Will I allow him to change my character? Will I allow him to make me like Jesus? Will I allow him to use me to tell others about Jesus, even if it costs me everything? You and I face that same decision. Are we ready? I think a lot of us think we're ready, but are we really? It's curious that many of us are willing to go to war, metaphorically or literally, to keep from wearing a mask, to keep from sending our kids to public school, to keep from being ruled by an administration we believe is wrong, but we won't walk across the street and start an intentional conversation with a friend or a neighbor who needs to know Jesus because we are terrified of what they might think of us if we do. We think we're ready. We're not. Mariama, the West African woman whose family kicked her out after her husband kicked her out and whose last name I'm not using because I read it on a site where they extracted last names for security purpose, lost virtually everything. Her husband beat her and divorced her because of her faith. He took their two children and the courts sided with him. She returned home. Her parents were so angry at the disgrace she had caused their family that they locked her into a room, refused to feed her for days, and periodically sent people into the room to beat her. She lost teeth. She has an unhealed skull fracture as a result of the assaults. And she was told she could come out of the room if she renounced her faith. So she sat in her room and she read her Bible voraciously because it was her only means of survival. Finally, her father, in frustration, ordered her to leave. Remember, she never learned any household skills, cooking, cleaning, because the servants in their household did all of that. She'd never held a job. She had no marketable skills. 
but she made it to a city two hours away and found a Muslim family that would hire her as a housekeeper in spite of her lack of skill. Unfortunately, because of her father's great influence, word got back to her parents where she was, and they pressured the family to fire her. She found a second family who hired her, and the cycle was repeated over and over again. Mariama's faith was growing, but her life was a mess. One day walking down the sidewalk between job interviews, she unexpectedly came face to face with Rachel, the missionary who had led her to Christ. Rachel took her to lunch, heard the story, and invited her to live with a missionary couple who were part of the same organization in the same city. And Rachel coached Mariama so that she could teach other women about Jesus Christ. And then they would take her out to villages outside of the city, and she would do Bible studies with women who were curious about Jesus. Dozens and dozens of women came to faith in Christ. And as more of them came to faith, they asked about what they could do for their children. And so Mariama began to plan children's events also. The largest one had 250 children attend a VBS-style program that Mariam, Mariama led in, the, in a village. And because the people with whom she lived and worked were Christians, her parents had no pressure they could impose on them to fire her. Under Marianam's teaching, the ministry thrived. But just when it was at what she thought was the peak of effectiveness, another member of the missionary team began to tell stories about her credibility and her ministry that undermined her with all of her supporters. Her financial support dried up. She lost her tiny house. She lost her car. She lost her influence. And over the next several months, the other missionaries were reassigned to other cities and other parts of Africa. And today, Mariama lives and works alone. So for her faith, she lost her marriage, she lost her children, she lost her parents, she's lost multiple jobs, she lost friends, she lost a home, she lost a car, yet she continues to persist in her faithful pursuit of producing fruit for Jesus Christ. Would you and I continue? Would we be good soil? Jesus said, listen, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Mark chose to include this parable because his first readers needed to listen and to hear. He knew the persecution they were facing would be severe. They had decisions to make, and their biggest decision was this. Will I follow Jesus and bear fruit even if it costs me everything? Mark's last readers, at least to date, include you and I. And we need to listen and hear too. Most of us, perhaps even all of us, in this room are not yet ready to answer that question. What will it take for us to become ready? We will explore that in the weeks to come. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, we thank you for even the hard parables that Jesus gives to us, the ones that make us squirm, the ones that make us think, I'm probably on the wrong side of this equation. When I look at my faith, God, I don't know if I'm the kind of person that would produce 30, 60, 100 fold in the middle of trials and tribulations and Satan hurling things at me and, and all kinds of cares of the world and things that tend to lead all of us away from you. God, I want to be 
that kind of follower of Jesus. And I know you've put that on the hearts of many people in this room too. May we walk away with Jesus' parable with a refreshed understanding that he didn't come to just give us a good life and a ticket to heaven, that he came to make us part of his plan to not only make us more like him, but also to introduce others to him through us. May we do that with great passion. May we be bold in the face of adverse circumstances. May we be the people that bear 